I will let's go to God's word this morning. Draw your attention again to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Our focus is verse 12 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 to 17. I want to ask you a question, and it's a simple question this morning, and perhaps your mind can go to your life since this morning when you got up, up to where we are and going forth. When you got up this morning, and when you think about things to be thankful for, what are you thankful for this morning? What is that one thing that you are thankful for? Or maybe let me not ask you for the one thing to be thankful for. If you were to write a list of five things here this morning about Thanksgiving, what would be in your list? Will the opportunity to serve Christ be in your list? If you were only to write five, will the opportunity to serve the Lord Jesus Christ be part of the five? that you are thankful for. I think that we often are not thankful for the opportunity to be around believers, to be in the church, or to be out on the outreach to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we think that we are doing other people favors. We often think that this is for someone and it is actually not for me. I do think that we think so many times in a selfish way that we do not see service as something we ought to be thankful for. In our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul will show us that saving the Lord is something we should be thankful for because it is undeserved. We do not deserve to be the servants of Jesus Christ. We do not deserve to be in his service, nor does he need us to be in his service. It is a privilege, it is an opportunity that we do not deserve. So my sermon this morning has a simple point of application. And here is the point. And I have tried to tone down this point so that every child here will understand what I am speaking about. So I'm not only speaking to the adults, but also I'm speaking to the young ones, the children who are in our midst. And here it is. Here's the point of application. Every believer must give thanks and praise to God for his mercy and grace. Are the children here? Do we have children in our church this morning? All right. I'm going to say it again, and you will hear Emma repeating it back to me. Every believer must give thanks and praise to God for his mercy and grace. Did you get that, Emma? What did I say? God's correct. Every believer must give thanks and praise to God for his mercy and grace. If Emma got it, I think we all got it, right? So that's what the Bible is going to bring before us this morning. So just turn to 1 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 12 to 17, and listen to Paul as he thanks God. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet, for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, 
invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 12, 7, 1, 12 to 17 is a testimony of God's mercy and grace. And just in terms of context, this section ties back to the previous section through the phrase which, with which I was entrusted in verse 11. Look back there in verse 11 so you can understand how this passage ties back to where we come from. In verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now we know that last week we looked at the use of the law and how the false teachers misunderstood the law by teaching it in a legalistic way. And the Apostle Paul comes and says, no, 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 no. That is not how the law should be used, nor its point or purpose. God has given us the law not for us to try and live according to it so that we can gain God's salvation. That is not the point of the law. But the law was given so that our sins can be exposed. And once our sins are exposed, we will cry out to, for the Savior. We will see our need for the Savior and we will cry out to Jesus to save us. And Paul says that's how the law should be used in the church. And we see in verse 9 that the Apostle Paul says things that we are to realize is this, that the law was not given for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, the lawless and the disobedient. He says the law was given for the ungodly and sinners. It was given for the profane. It was given for the kidnappers. It was given for the homosexuals. It was given for those who kill their mothers and, and fathers. The law was given for perjurers and for many other people who are living in sin. Why? So that they will see the need for the Savior. And in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, when we understand the law and sound doctrine, we are to understand it in, as it agrees with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The words according to in verse 11 there basically means in conformity to or in accordance or in agreement with. We are to teach the law in a way that it will agree with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. And the Apostle Paul says that we, about this gospel, the Lord has seen it fit to entrust it to me. I was entrusted with this gospel, the gospel of the glory of God. Now, as Paul reflects on this opportunity, despite who he was, he writes this thanksgiving and praisegiving testimony in verses 12 to 17. And notice how the, uh, the Apostle Paul opens this section in verse 12 and how he closes it in verse 17. He opens it up with thanksgiving and closes it with doxology. And that's how we are to be thinking about our salvation. Whenever we reflect on what God has done and what had, who we were and who we are now, we are to be thankful people and we are to be praising people. Look at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how the Apostle Paul opens this section. And look at how he closes it in verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a hymn of praise. The Apostle Paul writes there. So as we go through Paul's thanksgiving and praisegiving testimony, I want to ask you three applicational questions this morning. And these are questions that will help you appreciate God's glorious gospel over any other means of salvation that false teachers may try to sell to you. As you reflect on these questions, you will appreciate God's way of salvation. And that should cause you to discard other means that people offer you. You shouldn't accept legalism as a way of salvation, nor any other way but what Paul is about to present to us this morning. 
So question number one for application. Who do you have to thank for your salvation this morning? Who do you have to thank for your salvation? Who is your savior in more simple terms? If it takes you long to answer that question, then you ask yourself, do I really know the Savior? See, when you get up in the morning, that's the first thing we should be thinking about. How thankful am I for the Savior, Jesus Christ? So the answer is, you have to thank Christ Jesus, your Lord. And that's what Paul does here in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a statement of fact and it is complete and it is full of thanksgiving, gratitude. If we are to learn anything, it should be that. We are to be thankful people. And we are to thank Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that mean that Paul thanks Christ Jesus our Lord? while he packs at least three terms in one. Christ, Jesus, Lord. That's the object of his thanksgiving. And why, Paul, do you have to call him Christ Jesus our Lord? While I call him Christ because he is the Messiah, he is the promised one, he is the anointed one, God promised him in the Old Testament and he now stands before us. The Jews denied him and crucified him for calling himself the Messiah and I also did the same thing. But now I've come to bow my knee because I know he is the true Messiah. And when you get to that state, you will give thanks for that knowledge. But not only is he the Christ that is thinking, but he calls him Jesus. The term Jesus means Savior. Yeshua, Jesus, it means Savior. Matthew 121, the angel said to Joseph about the child his wife Mary was to give birth to. Mary conceived miraculously through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what the angel said to Joseph. She will bear a son, referring to Mary. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what the name Jesus means. It means the one who saves us from our sins, the Savior. I thank Christ Jesus, the Messiah, and he is Jesus, the Savior. And he says, our Lord. And Paul doesn't just throw that term, our Lord, there. But he says this because this is the one he met on that road to Damascus. When the light flashed around Saul, on that day when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, and Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? The answer was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Acts 9, verse 4 to 5. And from that day, Paul understood that he is the Lord. And he has to bow before him in worship. So Paul acknowledged Jesus as his Lord from that day onwards. And here he is, he gives Thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I ask you this morning, who do you have to thank for salvation? Is it Christ Jesus, your Lord? As I was driving out of where we live, I saw on a glass, or glass window of the security guards, three books stacked there, and they caught my attention. And those three books were the books of Mammon. The book of Mammon. It hit me as I drove through and thinking, those two security guards, I don't know who's the, who, who those books belong to, but I'm thinking about who they might be thanking for their salvation. 
Definitely, if you are reading the book of Mammon, you don't have Jesus to thank. And there are many who are gathered this morning, wherever, in many places, and they don't have Christ Jesus as their Lord to thank. They have been told, you are saved by your works. You are to follow your own traditions. And that's still, they are still blinded. You and I are privileged to give thanks to Christ Jesus, who is our Lord. Do you see that you are undeserving? When you come to serve him, do you realize that you are actually undeserving? You did not save yourself, but he is the one who saved you. Well, then the application is clear and simple this morning. Be thankful. Thank him. You have so much to thank him for. And the Apostle Paul is bringing us now to that. What is the Apostle Paul thanking Jesus for? Or what is the basis of his thanksgiving? That's our next application or question this morning. We don't just thank Jesus, but what do we thank him for? What is the basis of your gratitude? When you say, I thank Jesus, Christ Jesus, for his mercy and grace, what is your basis? Let's look at verses 12 to 14, and we will see Paul's basis for gratitude. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggress aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. See, Paul did not deserve this appointment into service, nor to be strengthened for that service. He did not deserve to be entrusted with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. It is precious. And yet, God in his mercy, he still entrusted to him. But why? Why was Paul not deserving to be entrusted with this gospel? Why was Paul not deserving to be strengthened and to, to be appointed to serve Christ Jesus as a deacon? Because that's the word he uses there. Why was he not deserving? Verse 13. Paul was a blasphemer. He slandered God and his gospel. That's what Paul did. We had this morning as Paul recounted his testimony in Acts 26. How he tells Agrippa that this was my life as I went out and I was dragging people to prison and I was approving of their death and I was out to aggressively persecute the church. And I blasphemed the gospel because I upheld the law above it. He was a persecutor and a violent opponent or aggressor who tried to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He violently dragged believers to prison. Surely he did not deserve to be strengthened and to be appointed for the gospel service. But Christ Jesus still chose him. Christ still chose him. And listen to Christ's words on that day of Paul's appointment. Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to 16. Here the Lord Jesus is speaking to Ananias. He's sending Ananias to go and, and bring Paul over to his place. And Ananias is hesitant. But God Lord, you, have, you know this guy has letters. He is actually on his way here to persecute us, your disciples. I think Ananias indeed have a, had a reason to be afraid of this Saul. And now listen to what Jesus says about him in verse 10 of Acts 9. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. 
But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That was Paul's appointment on that day. And Paul thanks Christ Jesus for appointing him to service despite his former evil life. Brothers and sisters, those are the kind of people God uses. Those are the kind of people Jesus Christ appoints to his service. People who will stand and say, formerly this is who I was. And now look at what the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ has done. When we sing about the wonderful cross of Jesus Christ this morning, we need to be reflecting on such testimonies. Despite who I was, the Lord chose me, and I don't know why. I don't know why he would choose me. I don't know why he would strengthen me. I don't know why he would give me such a precious gospel and send me out to make others know him because I did not deserve it. I blasphemed it. And God says, you are the right person to carry out this gospel because through you, many will see the power of the gospel. Do you see why we should not be holding on to the law as a way of salvation? Because there, if we try to depend and we sell work salvation, Jesus Christ does not get his glory. But it's only through men like the Apostle Paul with this kind of CV. Man who will be able to say, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. I understand and I will have a self-assessment, a proper self-assessment. And here it is. I was ignorant. I was an unbeliever. He's not saying this to give an excuse, but he's saying this as an acknowledgement of who he was, and that's who every human being is. You are ignorant seated here this morning if you are not formally ignorant. Every person born is born ignorant to the spiritual things because we do not know Paul says, I acted ignorantly. I thought that was the way of life. I thought that was the way of salvation. And I, that's the reason I rejected Jesus and killed his people. Until God in his mercy stopped me on my way, blinded me so that I can see properly. We do need that blinding. It may not be the light flashing around you. But there are ways the Lord Jesus Christ uses to get our attention, isn't it? Many of us here, the Lord has done that. There are ways God has used to get our attention. For the Apostle Paul, it was to close his eyes, literally. And in doing that, his spiritual eyes were opened. We are ignorant. The Bible says that those who killed Jesus, they did so because they were ignorant. Acts 3 verse 17. And that's the reason Jesus prayed on the cross. Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Do you know how else was prayed for, for that forgiveness? It was Paul, Saul, and those who were killing Stephen. Stephen, before he died, prayed that same prayer that his Savior prayed on the cross. Lord, do not count this sin against them. And boy, did God answer his prayer? He did. In Acts chapter 9, God answered Stephen's prayer by blinding Paul physically so that he can open his eyes spiritually to see. And he calls him and he says to him, you are going to open many people's eyes 
because I am setting, setting you apart. You know what it is like to be blind. And now that you can see, I will send you out so you can open people's eyes. He calls the blind because they are a greater testimony. If you acknowledge your blindness and your ignorance, you are the right person to carry the gospel to other blind people who are like you. So this is the testimony of the Apostle Paul. So it is true that given his CV, Paul did not deserve to be appointed as the minister of the gospel. And that is true of all of us. No one deserves God's mercy, which he shows ignorant people. Mercy, if you think about it, saves us from our misery. That's what mercy saves us from, from that ignorance. From all the consequences of sin, God in his mercy pulls us out. But there is more. Not only was Paul shown mercy, but he was also given abundant grace together with all that he needed to respond to the call of salvation. When I was reading this passage, how grateful was I that God did not leave me to try and scrape somewhere, grope for faith, but he did not only show me grace, but with that grace, he graciously gave me faith and love. God gives the full package, lest we should boast. He says so in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. God's grace overflows. Sinners are totally spiritually bankrupt. They have no faith, no love. And these two elements are needed to respond to God's saving grace and mercy. So God, in his abundant grace, gives us faith to trust him and love to adore him. Listen to Ephesians 2.8. Paul again writes there, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. What is that that pointing back to? It points back to faith. This faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Talk about God's love and mercy. It is displayed right here in that God says to you, Okay, I'm going to set you here and you have to win. And, but you will not have to try and, and, and get your own wisdom, nor your own ability to win. But I'm going to give you everything that you need to win. No matter what, you are not going to lose. We need to cross over to life. How does that happen? God gives us grace and mercy and love and faith. We need to come to him by faith, which we do not have. How does that happen? God says, I will give you that as well. Because sinners have none of that. Are you thankful for that? Are you thankful for faith? That God enabled you to believe. See, the Bible says believe. And yet you are not able to. And God says, even with that, it will still be mine, so that you don't have anything to boast about. Brothers and sisters, we have nothing to boast about, including our service to the Lord. It is all by grace that we are able to serve Him. It actually st uh, struck me as well that God does not call anyone to service. I think that maybe we have it other way around as the church and say, let's just get people to serve. But Jesus says this is an opportunity for the saved to serve him, to serve as diaconion, as deacons. God calls the saved to serve him and not the unbelievers. I think sometimes we set maybe unbelievers to failure in that we allow them to serve and in that they think we are doing so good for Jesus Christ. Christ calls believers to his service. So maybe that should be a criteria for each one of us. 
when I begin to say I'm going to serve with that church or with those believers, ask yourself, do I know the one they are serving or the one that I'm serving? Do, have I received mercy and grace in abundance? Do I have faith to trust in him? If the answer is no, the Apostle Paul says, the gospel is the answer. The glorious gospel of the blessed God. It will make you happy as the owner God is happy. He is the blessed God. is happy. It will make you thankful as well. So this faith and love are found in Christ Jesus. Therefore, Paul thanks Christ a lot for the undeserving appointment into service despite his former violent life against Jesus and his church. And Christ called him and entrusted him with the gospel to preach to the lost. But Paul is not done with his gratitude. He goes on to marvel at why God would choose to save him given the kind of person that he was. And he looks back at his former life and at how God in his mercy and grace has saved him and he can't help but to praise God for his perfect plan of salvation. And this is our last question. What is the reason for your gratitude? What is the reason for your gratitude? First, who do you have to thank? Christ Jesus, our Lord. Second, what is the basis of your gratitude? It is that you were formerly a sinner, a blasphemer, who acted ignorantly in unbelief. And God, through Jesus Christ, appointed you and chose you for his own service. That should be the basis for your gratefulness in that you look at your life and you say, I did not deserve this, and yet I was set apart for it. It is by grace. Lastly, what is the reason for gratitude? Verse 15 to 17. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, our translation says, chief of sinners, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Let's stop there for now. Paul says the reason my gratitude is that God is going to use my former life and his salvation to show many people his grace. I wasn't saved just for myself, but I was saved so that I can be an example of what God's mercy and grace can do. Hence, Paul says it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. So what is it, Paul, that is to be accepted about your statement? He says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We know we were born sinners. And Psalm 51 affirms that Truth, when David cries out to God, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Why? For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. I think we all can say we are chief of sinners. We foremost. We're not better than the Apostle Paul. All sinners, both old and young, must pray this prayer to receive the forgiveness of sin. Christ Jesus came into the world, Paul says. And this refers to his incarnation when he took on flesh. For we know that there is no salvation 
without his incarnation. And he gives the reason. He says he came, he did that to save sinners. But that's not all Paul is thankful for. But what Paul is thankful for is that he, the sinner, given all that he has done, has received this mercy so that the perfect patience of God may be displayed. Paul says, I am thankful for my ignorance and for God's mercy because bringing that together, God uses me as an exhibit, as a demonstration, as a display of his mercy to other sinners. Those who will believe, they will believe because they would have seen that this man who was a persecutor, this man who was violent, this man who was blasphemer has been saved. Brothers and sisters, as we bring this message to a close, think about how the Lord can use your testimony to reach out to many. I know that we have done so much that we are shameful of. We don't even want to think nor to bring up things that we have done in the past. But being honest like David in Psalm 51 and being honest like Paul in 1 Timothy 1 with what, with what God has done in our lives and who we were before, that testimony can help someone see the marvelous, glorious power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and draw them to Christ. So if anything, this passage is all about a testimony of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in acknowledging who we were formerly and in acknowledging who we are today. And in both acknowledgement, we get to understand that the rescuing grace and mercy belongs only to Christ Jesus and not to ourselves. So, for those among us who may not be believers, when you look at the Apostle Paul here, and if you have, you've ever thought that your sin was beyond God's saving grace, think again. If God could save a person who blasphemed him and violently persecuted his church and approved of his servant's death, he can save you as well. And Jesus calls you as you Ah, he's not asking you to stop being a blasphemer first before you come. He's not asking you to stop your violence before you come. He's not asking you to first go and deal with your sin before you can come to him. But he's saying, bring your sin with you so you can see my glorious gospel at work. And that's the call to each one of us here. Because Paul says there is this overflowing grace and there is faith and love accompanying them. And God gives them all to those who will come to him. Believers among us, Paul never stopped retelling this testimony and he always shared his testimony in order to display God's saving power. And that should be an example for us. That we should never stop telling. When you read the book of Acts, you'll find that this testimony is repeated at least three times. Why does he do that? He does that because he wants those who are listening to him to see God's marvelous grace. So testimony of God's salvation for our lives is important. Never get tired of telling that story of his mercy and grace. And be specific when you tell it as the Apostle Paul was. That is what the Apostle Paul has for us today. So who are you? Who do you have to thank? I pray that it will be Christ Jesus your Lord. What's the basis of your thanksgiving? You are a sinner Saved by grace, you have the grounds to thank him for mercy and grace. And what should motivate you to give, keep on giving thanks to God for his mercy and grace? Because he is using you as an instrument to show others.
his perfect patience and his perfect grace and mercy? Those three questions should ring within our minds and our hearts. And may indeed the Lord Jesus Christ use us to show others this glorious gospel. Show others that there is no any other way of salvation but Christ. Through his grace and mercy, we find salvation in him. Let's thank him together. Lord, many times we get so confused and lost in the details of big theological words instead of simply saying what you have done in our lives, instead of simply giving thanks for even strength to serve you, for the opportunity to serve you. Lord, in our pride at times we we are so quiet and we don't tell people where you found us. We speak of your grace and your mercy as though they were up, abstract terms instead of showing what their power looked like in our lives. And here we have the Apostle Paul in simple terms saying, I am just thankful and I will worship God. Might that be, Lord, our attitude from here, that we will sit back and say, I am thankful that I can be a servant of Christ Jesus. I am thankful that though I was a sinner, I am saved by grace. I am thankful that God saved me so that others may see his perfect salvation in me. Lord, I pray that these words of Paul, this testimony, will be our testimony. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.